All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, we are very happy today to have uh, Pranava Gianti from University of Southern California, and who is going to talk about uh, uh, a model for super for superfluidity and more precisely about mass transfer and global solutions in a micro local micro uh, micro scalar scale micro scale model of superfluidity. So, Pranava, please go ahead. It's all yours. Uh, thank you, Harun, uh, and thank you also to the rest of the group at, uh, at NYU Abu Dhabi for the uh, invitation to present here. I'm going to talk about um, some of my uh, recent work in collaboration with Igor Kukavecha and Juhi Chang here at the University of Southern California. So um, the work is basically centered around uh, a small scale or a micro scale model of superfluidity, and uh, we look the existence of a certain class of weak solutions to it. And so um, I think before, before we go into the mathematical details, it's probably a good idea to explain what superfluidity is because it's not a very well-known topic in mathematics itself. Uh, it's a very well-studied topic in physics. So uh, generally, we, we know that um, Navier-Stokes equations are used as the most common description of, uh, of fluids, right? And the most common model uh, or subclass of Navier-Stokes is uh, when we talk about Newtonian fluids, where the, the shear stresses in the fluid are linearly proportional to the shear strain rates. Okay, And this leads to the existence of a viscosity to the fluid. So we talk about viscous uh, Navier-Stokes or, or viscous fluids. Um, and uh, viscosity, basically, uh, even though macroscopically it manifests as some kind of a, a, a and a drag, um, but at microscopic uh, scales, it arises from the um, drive for particles of different momenta um, to exchange momentum with each other. So there are particles at different layers of the fluid which have um, different uh, momentum, and then when they collide with each other, they exchange that momentum and then achieve some kind of equilibrium. But there are certain fluids which are fundamentally inviscid, okay, and they're called superfluids. And for this to happen, um, you must therefore expect, looking at it from a microscopic perspective, you must expect all particles are moving in unison. Okay? And um, this happens in the ground state of a Bose-Einstein condensate, okay? which uh, is itself a, a formed by a quantum mechanical phase transition. So there is no classical analog to this. You cannot describe this through purely classical physics. Okay. Um, there are a few different superfluids. The most common are helium-4 and helium-3. Okay, uh, Helium-4 is by far the most commonly studied uh, superfluid, and it achieves superfluidity around 2 degrees. It's extremely cold. So it's about minus 271 degrees Celsius. Okay, And once this superfluid phase is achieved, um, you have some really cool properties, um, such as... Uh, the existence of a critical velocity below which the superfluid is actually inviscid. Okay, and then there are other things like film flow where um, because there is no viscosity, the, the surface tension of the superfluid alone is enough to overcome gravity so the superfluid can actually climb out of any vessel that it's put in. If you store it in a bowl, it'll just climb out of the bowl and creep out. Okay, um, So there are some really uh, extraordinary properties that uh, helium-4 uh, possesses. Um, just to set the stage a little better uh, on a more solid foundation, here's a, a phase diagram of helium-4. So we know that uh, from daily experience, if you cool down any substance, it goes from gas to liquid, and then eventually at some point from liquid to solid. And you would expect that once you reach zero Kelvin, everything has to become solid. Um, that is true for helium only at high pressure, so above about 25 bar. If you do this kind of cooling, at a constant pressure that is below 25 bar, you go from this liquid phase here. Um, by the way, are, are you able to see I'm cursed? Yeah, we can see everything, yeah. Okay, so you go from this liquid phase as you cool at a constant pressure into another liquid phase, which is the superfluid phase, and it remains superfluid all the way to zero Kelvin, so it never becomes a solid, okay? And it turns out that it's around 2.17 Kelvin that this transition to superfluidity starts. And as you keep cooling down from 2.17 all the way to zero Kelvin, 
the fraction of normal fluid, so this is the, the density of normal fluid divided by the total density, this fraction decreases and the fraction of the superfluid increases. Eventually at zero Kelvin, you have pure superfluid. Okay, so, but between zero and 2.17, you have a mixture of both the fluids. So at zero Kelvin, the pure superfluid is usually described uh, using a nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which is a fairly good description at, uh, at low energies of the particles. Okay. But at, like I just mentioned with the graph, at non-zero temperatures, um, only a part of the normal liquid, normal helium, will have condensed into the superfluid phase. Right? So, which means you will have to characterize this, the, the interactions between the two phases. Okay? Um, I want to mention right now that this is not like the regular two-phase flow that uh, you may have come across in classical fluid dynamics, where, for instance, if you have the flow of uh, water and steam, maybe in a power plant, then you, you will actually have phase boundaries, right? Where you have some uh, bubbles of the vapor phase, and then you will have the liquid phase. So you can actually construct the boundaries of the phase uh, of the two phases. This doesn't exist in a superfluid because it's a quantum mechanical transition. Uh, what, what one should picture it uh, is as there are two kinds of um, helium atoms in the whole box, the container. Some of them, behave like a superfluid, some of them behave like a normal fluid, and in general, they don't interact with each other. They just pass, they, they, they occupy the entire volume. Both phases occupy the entire volume. But they do interact at certain, at, at some points, okay? And um, the, we will get into the actual nature of interaction shortly, okay? But for now, it is important to recognize that there is no phase boundary here. Both the phases occupy the entire um, the entire uh, volume of the container. Okay, and the reason to study this the, these kinds of uh, systems is because uh, superfluid helium is used a lot in modern physics, uh, in experimental physics especially, as a cryogen. So um, it's used in the Large Hadron Collider to cool down magnets below their superconducting temperature so that they can actually be superconducting. It's also found a lot of use in quantum computing as a heat transfer uh, medium because superfluid helium uh, transfers heat much, much better than uh, regular helium. Uh, there are also uses of it in like dark matter experiments and many, many other uh, fields. So it's very important to understand uh, the behavior of, the, of these two phases. Okay. Uh, now I want to present first the model that we use. So this model was um, derived by Pitevsky, uh, a physicist in 1959. So the superfluid phase of helium is described using uh, a nonlinear Schrodinger equation with this kind of power nonlinearity. Um, and the, the normal fluid of helium is described using an incompressible inhomogeneous Navier-Stokes. So rho is the density of the normal fluid and u is the velocity. Okay. Um, it, it should be noted that Pitevsky's original model did a much more general derivation where uh, it was assumed that the normal fluid is fully compressible, okay? but uh, that model becomes very uh, complicated to deal with. So as a first step, we, we are considering the divergence-free uh, limit of the velocity. Okay? So we assume that the velocity of the normal fluid is divergence-free, but there is uh, some inhomogeneity in the fluid. Okay? Um, and you wonder what um, the B is. So B is the operator that couples the superfluid and the normal fluid. Okay. And for those of you who have uh, studied quantum mechanics before, you may recognize that the momentum operator in quantum mechanics is minus I uh, Planck's constant H times uh, the gradient operator. That is the momentum operator. So here we've set the, uh, the Planck's constant to be one. So H is one. Um, we also set the mass of the helium atom M to be one. So minus I grad is the momentum of um, the superfluid helium. You divide that by the mass, which is one. So this is the velocity or, or the momentum of the superfluid helium minus M times U, where M is one. M times U is the momentum of the normal fluid. So you have a relative momentum you square that and divide by two times m, m being one again, that gives you the relative kinetic energy. So the coupling is 
uh, is composed of a relative kinetic energy between the two fluids. So what it does is if there's a difference in the momenta of the two fluids, it tends to equilibrate them. Okay. Uh, so in that sense, it's a retarding interaction. Okay. And there is also some term here uh, in the coupling which denotes the self-interactions of the superfluid itself, okay, uh, which is the same form as this power nonlinearity here. So, um, so, 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 so I have a question here. It's, so you said it's the same form, but one is real and the other one is uh, uh, imaginary, right? Like those um, terms, the... Because I'm not understanding, because the, the non-linearity appears on, in two places. It appears on the left and on the right in your first equation. Uh, here? Yeah, in the B psi. In B psi, you have the non-linearity. Correct. Psi to the power P plus one, but also on the right-hand side, you have it. Yeah, so um, so, so the, the way this, uh, this equation was derived by Pitevsky is he, he assumed that the relaxation mechanism should be very similar to the actual uh, dynamical uh, relation of the fluid. So because the actual dynamics is governed by a momentum square here, which is the oh, Laplace okay. and a self-interaction, he said we should have the same thing here, except now the momentum is shifted by to be the relative momentum. So th that was the and assumption. Also, also, the, the, also the one term is... Uh... One term is uh, complex and the other one is uh, uh, one is uh, pure imaginary, the other one is real, right? So there is also that difference, I guess. Um, well, here you have mu times psi as well, so it's not purely real here. Okay. No, but I mean I, I, there is an I. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mu, uh, yes, lambda yes. and mu and real, right? Lambda and mu are real. Lambda and mu are real. So lambda is the coupling constant. So it tells you how strong the coupling between the two fluids is. And mu is a self-interaction constant. So okay. it tells you how strongly this superfluid interacts with itself. Hmm. They're both real. They're both positive. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. So this is the model that we're using. Um, in We also added a, a, a linear drag term to the uh, momentum equation in order to uh, get some coercive estimates uh, so that we can actually prove global existence of solutions. Okay, um, So that is the difference. Uh, so the two main differences from the original model are uh, we included divergence-free velocity and we included a drag. Okay, um, The original model was also derived uh, including some thermal effects which or entropy transport, which we've uh, ignored here. And uh, it was derived for a very generic um, in self-interaction here, we've taken it to be the power law because that's the most commonly used uh, mechanism. So as I said, we have the drag coefficient, the uh, self-interaction constant mu, the viscosity of the normal fluid mu, the coupling constant lambda, all of these are positive. The nonlinear index here, P, is taken to be bigger than or equal to one. And we study the system on um, the torus in two or three dimensions. Okay, so this this is our uh, our model. So let me uh, I've already mentioned a few of these, but let me quickly go through the features. So it is a nonlinearly coupled NLS NSE, right? Schrodinger and uh, Navier-Stokes equation system. Uh, the coupling is like relative kinetic energy, right? The NLS, if you notice, actually turns parabolic here because. Um, It has a minus Laplacian without an I in front of it. So you get a lambda times minus half Laplacian. So it becomes like, uh, it becomes a parabolic equation. Here. Whereas earlier it was a purely dispersive equation in the absence of the coupling. This coupling makes it uh, dissipated. And this will be very useful to our analysis. Um, there is a bidirectional mass and momentum transfer between the, uh, the two systems, uh, the two fluids. Okay. And uh, which basically means that some of the superfluid atoms can convert into normal fluid and some of the normal fluid can become superfluid. So it's going both ways. Okay. Um, now, this is the most important thing that the continuity equation has a sine indefinite source term. So this is a continuity equation. Normally it is equal to zero, but here, here we have a, a source um, due to couple, right? And this is 
in some sense, the measure of how much the normal and superfluid are turning into each other, are converting from one form to the other. And this is sign indefinite. Okay? There is no fixed, uh, it's not either all positive or all negative. Okay. However, if you integrate this over the entire domain, over the entire torus, then that integral is non-negative. Okay. And if you integrate this, the second term in the continuity equation, that vanishes because of the periodic boundary conditions. And the integral of this will give you the rate of change of the normal fluid mass, right? D, dt of the integral of rho. So that is non-negative. So which means that overall, there is a net conversion of superfluid into normal fluid. But locally at any point, you cannot say that it is only a super to normal conversion. It can be the other way around as well. But over the entire domain, there is a net conversion of superfluid to normal fluid. Um, yeah, and we assumed uh, divergence free velocity and also the hey, power bar. Can, can you really explain this uh, convert? Why why you said there is a net conversion? Ah, so if you integrate this uh, the entire continuity equation over the torus, right? This term oh. vanishes. Yeah. Um, and this term, uh, it it is just using the expression for b here. It is possible to show that this term is actually non-negative. Ah. Oh. So, which means that the rate of change of mass of the normal fluid is non-negative. Okay. So, so over the entire domain... Is there a physical there is... explanation for that? Like, the fluid yeah. like, will move from superfluid to normal fluid? Yes, so that, that is the physically observed or the expectation is that um, because of the interaction, the uh, you can think of the superfluid as if it's being heated up. So it converts slowly into normal fluid eventually. Okay. So the, the, like I said, the superfluid is a Bose-Einstein condensate phase. So it's the ground phase in a quantum system. So from that ground state, as it heats up, it moves into the higher excited states, which are all the normal fluid. So that's what you want to model. You want the system to be such that it converts super into normal fluid. Okay. And that's what Pitevsky was going for when he wrote down this model. All right, um, and we've added the linear drag term again um, to induce uh, coercive estimates. So um, now we want to look for solutions to the system, okay? And we're going to look for, for weak solutions. So we call them weak. However, what we have is um, strong solutions in the wave function and the velocity, but weak in the density. So that's, that, that's why we call them weak because one of them is uh, between psi, u, and rho, one of them is weak. Okay, so for any given t um, and initial conditions, velocity is in H2, uh, sorry, the wave function H2, the velocity is in H1 divergence free, and the density is in L infinity. Um, we will call this triplet psi u rho a weak solution uh, to the Pitevsky model if they have the following regularity. Okay, um, Most important thing is to notice that the regularity of the rho, uh, the density is just L infinity in, in time and space. Okay and that um, the equations are satisfied in the sense of distributions okay, for appropriately chosen tet functions. So this is of, uh, of the solution that, that we're interested in. So um, there are some related uh, works for the NLS or um, the Navier Stokes, but very few when both of these are, are combined. So I just want to quickly mention what these the closest uh, uh, papers might be. So NLS plus some extra potentials to model similar kind of systems, but where uh, you, you're studying dipolar quantum gases, there are some papers in, in that direction, some works there. And uh, also looking at uh, a fluid dynamical picture of of the Schrodinger equation, of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, is a well studied, uh, well studied uh, topic. It's called quantum hydrodynamics, right? Where the, the complex wave function, uh, the, the equation for the wave function is converted uh, into a pair of equations, one describing mass conservation, another describing momentum conservation, right? And it, there's also the existence of a quantum pressure, which is a very nasty term um, that arises in the analysis there. Okay, and there are uh, several papers, particularly by Jungle and by uh, Hattori, 
in in the study of uh, QHD systems, quantum hydrodynamics, which themselves are actually a special class, a special case of the more general uh, Kortobeg uh, type uh, equations. Okay, so weak solutions to some QHD type uh, models have been studied uh, uh, quite a bit by Antonelli and Marcati, uh, and also by Jungle. So, um, sorry. There is a, some nice work by Antonelli and Marcati where um, they introduced something called the fractional step method, where they actually looked at a superfluid interacting with a normal fluid, uh, except the interaction was one way. So the normal fluid was modeled as a fully compressible system, but the momentum equation or the continuity equation were not affected by the wave function. Only the wave function was affected by the density and velocity of the normal fluid. Okay. So it was a one-way interaction of the, uh, of the uh, Schrodinger equation. Um, and uh, for that, they introduced a, a novel fractional step method to account for these interactions and to, to show the existence of, of solutions, uh, weak solutions. Okay. Um, and the um, inhomogeneous incompressible Navier-Stokes, which we consider has a rich history. It's been studied a lot because it's sort of an intermediary between the fully uh, compressible Navier-Stokes, which can be uh, much more complicated to analyze, and uh, the uh, incompressible Navier-Stokes, which is perhaps the most studied PD. Okay, so somewhere in, in between these is the inhomogeneous incompressible Navier-Stokes, right? So uh, there's uh, there are many papers in this direction, starting all the way in the 70s by Kazikov, who looked at uh, local weak solutions and then uh, ladies and sky approved uh, local and global strong solutions um, and then uh, came the school of uh, of koi and kim who introduced uh, the uh, method of uh, of using showing that if the initial data satisfied a compatibility criterion then um, you can actually show uh, you can handle even the existence of vacuum states um, in the fluid so where the density goes to zero okay so um, this model, we explored the local existence of solutions without drag in some previous work okay, with, uh, with Constantina Trevisa. Um, but, and I want to mention that this Pitevsky model that we consider here in all of these works is, uh, is the first investigation of a bidirectionally coupled uh, Schrodinger equation with Navier-Stokes. Uh, even in the physics literature, uh, it, it hasn't received as much attention with respect to computational uh, exploration or investigation, because it's very it's very complicated, as you can imagine. Uh, this Navier-Stokes itself is quite complicated to simulate uh, numerically to very high precision, and then to do to add to that the uh, Schrodinger equation, it's just too many degrees of freedom, I suppose. So there have been a few attempts, uh, one or two attempts, but uh, not very many. Okay. Um, and as I mentioned, the Antonelli Marcati work of 2015 uh, is a unidirectionally coupled model, not bidirectionally coupled. Okay. Um, the analysis that we follow is most closely can be related to um, Kim's work from 1987, where uh, uh, he investigated the inhomogeneous and compressible Navier Stokes um, with uh, while allowing for vacuum state. So the density could actually vanish. Uh, um, but we don't do that. We require the density to be bounded uh, below. For, for technical reasons. So we will we work with a density that is bounded both below and above. Okay. And also we have the source term, which is the root of all our problems while analyzing the system. Okay. Um, the initial velocity and density have the same regularity as uh, the paper in the work by Kim. So velocity is in H1 and rho is in L infinity, okay, which is uh, less than the strong solutions that are worked uh, that are used in, in or developed in COI. Uh, Kim's work. Okay, um, so with that bit of a background, let's uh, mention our first uh, theorem, which is um, the global existence of the of solutions in two dimensions. Okay, and we consider first uh, weak nonlinearities. What does that mean? Uh, it means we fix our nonlinearity index, which you recall would be mod psi to the power of p, uh, right? That power p, which is the nonlinearity index, is between one and four. Four not included. Okay, so it's a weak self interaction of the fluid of the superfluid with itself, which means it can interact strong. It interacts relatively strongly with the normal fluid. Okay, 
and it therefore it transfers momentum uh, effectively to the normal fluid and you can expect global solutions which is what we have here okay so we take our initial wave function to be in h five halves and the initial velocity to be h1 divergence free uh, and the initial density to have a lower bound of little m i where i denotes initial and capital m i okay um, then the, the way this theorem is structured is as follows. We know that we're given that the initial density has a lower bound of mi and an upper bound of big mi. So uh, if we choose any value between zero and mi, right, which we call mf, so the final lower bound density, right? And so we say that we do not want the density to go below that value, okay? Um, then we can guarantee that uh, there exists a universal a constant, epsilon naught, which depends only on the system parameters, right? So that's that if your initial data is less than that small constant, right, the norm of the initial data, um, then we can guarantee the existence of a global weak solution. Okay? So there is a user-specified minimum to the density, okay, MF. And if you specify that, then I can tell you what, how small the data should be in order to guarantee that the solution never goes below MF and it always uh, re remains above that. So the density will never uh, vanish and you will have uh, a, a solution that exists forever, okay? And the solution, uh, as I said, is strong in the wave function and velocity. So it's continuous in time uh, H five halves and L2 H seven halves. So this comes from the, the fact that the NLS is now parabolic. So this is the dissipation now, right? And the velocity is continuous in time H1 and L2 H2. And the density is uh, is in L infinity space and time. Um, and you we can also use uh, the renormalization uh, theory, you know, from Deepana and Lyon to um, actually show that it is strongly continuous in time in the uh, LR spaces where R is strictly less than infinity, okay? And finally, because of the regularity that we have for the wave function and velocity, the solution that we get uh, also satisfies the energy balance as an equality, not as an equal. And this is the energy of the system. So we have the kinetic energy of the normal fluid. This is the kinetic energy of the um, superfluid. This is like a potential energy of the superfluid. And then you have the viscous dissipation here, the drag dissipation, and the, the a dissipation coming from the coupling, from the superfluid coupling. Okay, so this is the overall energy dissipation here in the second line. And all of this is equal to uh, the initial energy of the system. Initial kinetic, initial kinetic, and initial potential. Okay, so um, so this this is our basic um, theorem in in two dimensions for weak nonlinearities. Okay, um, now we also have something to say about strong nonlinearities. So, um, if our nonlinearity index is p is equal to four in two D, okay, then we can we have the same properties as in the previous theorem, except we can only uh, show that the uh, existence is guaranteed up to some finite time which scales uh, exponentially with the inverse size of the data. So if the data is of size epsilon, then the existence time scales like exponential of epsilon, uh, one over eps square root of epsilon. Okay, so as epsilon becomes smaller, you have a very, very long existence time. So we call it almost global existence. And for P bigger than four, so, so for very strong nonlinearities, um, the existence time scales polynomially um, with the size of the data in this fashion. And once again, in both of these cases, the solutions um, satisfy the energy equality. Okay, so the, these are our, our main results in, in two dimensions. Okay, and uh, so I want to briefly explain the, the strategy employed here. So the, the approach used for this model is completely energy estimates based. Okay, so energy based. So the first thing is we notice that um, the density is not purely transported, right? because of the source term on, on the right-hand side. So um, uh, like I mentioned, we restrict our evolution time to some prescribed minimum value of the density, MF, okay? And our aim here is to show that the density never goes below this prescribed MF, 
Okay, so we want to show this this that row never goes below this and make that estimate to be time independent. That is the final uh, goal. So we can write down the formal solution to the continuity equation along characteristics. Okay, and that will be this. So where uh, x alpha of t is uh, is the characteristic that begins at alpha at the coordinate at the point alpha in the domain. Right, and then you move along that characteristic for for time t to be at the coordinate x alpha of t. Right, so then this is our solution, formal solution. Now we know that this is bounded below by m i, right? The, this quantity here, m i. We want this to be bounded below by m f, which means it is sufficient uh, if we can bound this this source term here by m i minus m f. Okay, so this whole thing must be bounded by mi minus mf above. Okay. That way we can guarantee that this is bounded below by mf. And another, a further sufficient condition for that is that psi in L infinity and b psi in L infinity when integrated from zero to the existence time, capital T, right? this integral is less than mi minus mf. So um, this is what really drives our, our analysis. Um, and in, in, in two dimensions, uh, we use the embedding that um, that uh, h1 plus a little bit right, is embedded in L infinity, right? So uh, b psi in L infinity can be uh, bounded from above by b psi in h1 plus something. Now, remember that the coupling operator b has a Laplacian in it. So that's the highest derivative order. So b psi in h1 plus a little bit means psi is in h3 plus a little bit. So if we can prove this, of the order of h three plus a little bit, then we'll be done. Okay, so that that's the that this is what is this is the direction we're headed in. So we we do several le levels of a priori estimates. So the first one is with the mass, the mass of the superfluid. So uh, we can derive an equation for so the mass of the superfluid is mod psi in L two square. Okay, that that is the mass. Um, so we can derive an equation for that using starting from the NLS. And we find that DDT of the superfluid mass plus this quantity, which is the integral of psi bar B psi is equal to zero. And like I said, um, this term here is positive right, or non-negative. In fact, it is, it's coercive because it, it's, uh, it is bounded from below by this potential energy term, okay, the LP plus two norm of the superfluid. So we can use this and uh, to derive a polynomially uh, polynomial decay for the superfluid mass. So the superfluid mass, which is denoted by S, um, decays as t to the power of two by p or t to the power of minus two by p. Right, that is the polynomial decay. Okay, so this is a, a quantification of of this mass conversion from superfluid to normal fluid. Um, the next estimate we have is uh, at the energy level, right? So to derive the energy estimates, as usual, we multiply the Navier-Stokes with U, and then we multiply the Schrodinger equation with minus Laplacian of the wave function uh, to get the kinetic energy contribution. And you also test NLS with um, mod psi to the P times psi to get the potential energy uh, contribution, okay? Um, and in all of this, Remember that going back um, to the energy equation, um, the so this is the potential energy contribution, okay, um, to the energy, and we have a dissipation which looks like b psi, right? N not like Laplacian of psi. So to do that, um, what we do is when when we have a Laplacian psi, we trade that for a b psi plus some correction terms. We are able to derive an expression purely in terms of b psi. And so this gives us uh, any energy balance equation. So U in L2, um, psi in H1, um, and, and also the potential energy term. That alone is not enough. So we go one order higher. So we derive a higher order energy, right? So we test the Navier-Stokes with minus Laplacian U so that we get uh, U in L infinity H1 and L2 H2, okay? Um, and we also test the Schrodinger equation with minus Laplacian square so that we were able to derive an estimate for the wave function in L infinity 
H dot two and L2 H dot three. Okay, so it seems like we're almost there because remember we needed a little bit more than H3 and we're at H, uh, we're just at H3 right now at this level. Okay, and the most important thing is generally when we talk about the uh, dissipation control uh, of Navier-Stokes, so we say that um, the gradient U in L2 square integrated from zero to time T is bounded by the initial energy. So this is the cumulative dissipation from zero up to the time T. So in our case, we're able to um, find, uh, derive an expression for the dissipation from time t to 2t. So in these dyadic time intervals, so like one to two seconds, two to four seconds, four to eight, and so on. And this will be useful later on. So we find that even across these, um, these different dyadic intervals, the overall uh, dissipation across each interval is decreasing uh, by an exponential term and also by a polynomial term. So Actually, it is uh, dominated by this polynomial decay of the dissipation. So, like I said, we've reached H3 here. We need a little bit more. So to do that, we go for the highest order uh, estimate for Psi. This is the last estimate. So we test the Schrodinger equation with minus Laplace into the power of some S, right? S being between one and two, okay? Um, and we, in particular, we fix S to be five fourths um, so that uh, we can actually take advantage of the already uh, known estimates for U. So velocity is in L infinity H1 and L2 H2 and interpolating between them, we get L4 H3 halves, um, which is very useful for to handle the nonlinear terms in the coupling operator, okay? And once we perform the energy estimates at this level, right, with S is five by four, we end up with uh, what we need, which is um, psi is L infinity H five halves and L two H seven halves, okay? Uh, and once again, we can derive a dyadic time decaying dissipation, right? So while it is in L two H seven halves from zero to whatever time you want, um, it is also in this thing from T to two T with this kind of polynomial um, decay to the dissipation. Okay, so what is what is being dissipated between one and two seconds is more than what's being dissipated between two and four and more than what is being dissipated from four to eight and so on. And that is a very uh, useful thing for us. So finally, what do we need? Um, just to refresh everyone's memory, we're trying to show, we're trying to limit this term here, or rather this term to be less than this prescribed mi minus mf, right? So this, you want to control this. So We've we've uh, we've achieved can, this control. Can I ask a question? Can, can you explain yeah. this uh, dyadic thing about the dissipation that you are mentioning? Yeah. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so what I'm saying is that what the usual uh, est the dissipation estimate would give is that the dissipation from time zero up to time, let's say, some capital T, is bounded by the initial energy, right? That's the maximum energy you can dissipate. So, that, that, but that's just a constant. So the dissipation from zero to capital T is a constant, is bounded by a constant. What we have here is that the dissipation from T to 2T uh, decays polynomial. So the dissipation from, uh, from one to two seconds is more than the dissipation from two to four, which is more than the dissipation from four to eight, and so on. And this allows us to set up a geometric series of this dissipation. So because we're interested in taking our integral here from zero to basically infinity, right? We want this to hold independent of time. You want to go from zero to infinity. So the idea is to split it into a short-term estimate from zero to one, and then long-term estimates dyadically. So beyond one second, we write it as one to two, two to four, four to eight, and so on in dyadic intervals. And because we have this polynomial decrease of this uh, of each of these dyadic windows of dissipation, um, that allows us to construct a convergent geometric series in place of this integral from one to infinity. And that allows us to show that the entire integral from zero to infinity will be finite. And, and with small enough data, you can make that less than whatever is on the right-hand side. Uh, I, I hope that that is clear, or at least some yeah, level. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, that's exactly what I was 
uh, explaining. Um, so we we split the time integral between zero one and then between these dyadic intervals. Um, the short time estimates are uniformly bounded, right? Because we know that zero to t is bounded. Um, so from zero to one, that will be bounded uniformly, right? And um, so and for the latter of these, we use this um, convergent or divergent geometric series. So for certain values of p, it is convergent and it leads to the global solutions. For other values of p, it is divergent and it leads to the uh, almost global case where you can only guarantee it for an exponentially long time or a polynomially long time. Okay, so that that's the re this is the reason for this global and almost global uh, differences. Okay. Okay, uh, I want to mention, a, so that's the basic strategy. I want to mention a few words about the existence. So to do the existence after deriving all the estimates, uh, a priori estimates, we construct an approximate uh, system of equations. Here, um, a, a Gellerkin scheme, basically a Gellerkin scheme for the velocity and wave function. Okay. Um, the Gellerkin velocity is constructed through uh, this finite dimensional uh, representation using the eigenfunctions of the Stokes operator. And for the wave function, we use eigenfunctions of the Laplacian or the negative Laplacian. Okay. Um, and then the uh, initial, the approximate initial velocity and approximate initial wave function are basically projections um, of the initial velocity and wave function, u naught and psi naught, onto these finite dimensional spaces. Um, we also consider an approximate uh, sequence of initial densities, right, of, which are smooth and converge to the initial density in L2. And we use uh, standard tricks from ODE theory and contraction mapping arguments for the for the velocity and wave function. Um, for the uh, density equation, for a fixed n, right, so we first establish the existence of solutions using characteristics, and then using uniform bounds, we uh, from the a priori estimates, we can uh, extract weak uh, weakly convergent solutions, and then with co compactness, we can we can get strong convergence as well. Okay, so that's the, the, the usual tricks of the trade um, for the existence part. Um, we also do the uh, renormalization. Uh, I don't know how much time I have left. Um, yeah, like 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay, it, yeah, maybe it, I can. Including questions, so let's, let's say 10 minutes if. Okay, expected. okay. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, we use, uh, I mentioned renormalization at the beginning while explaining the basic uh, theorem, which is, um, that once you have a weak solution row, right, which we do from, from here, from the existence part, um, that is an L infinity, L infinity, right? We, we can show that it is actually also in um, con strongly continuous in time and L R for R less than infinity. So if you go a little bit less than L infinity in space, you get strong continuity in time. Okay? That's the notion of renormalized renormalize solutions um, in Deepen and Lyon's uh, famous paper from, I believe the, uh, maybe the eighties or even prior to that. So, um, so yeah, it follows by first modifying the solution that we have uh, and then uh, establishing the uh, required converts for the modified. Uh, and then we go on to show that the approximations that we can, that we constructed the row N approximations actually converge in this uh, LR norms um, to our solution rho of t. Okay. Um, the, the reason we have LR, R being between one and infinity is because of the uh, Sobolev embedding, H1 is in LR in two dimensions. So as we'll see next in three dimensions, uh, we will, because we only have H1 is in LR for R up to six, we can only do renormalized solutions up to L6 and not more than that. Okay, so so that that's that in two dimensions. Uh, we also have a result in three dimensions. Okay, so for the same model. Um, so th the main argument here is that we have unfavorable Sobolev embeddings, right? We we don't have the uh, um, h plus a little bit is in L infinity. Here we need h three by two plus some a little bit to be in L infinity. Okay, um, so which means we will need pretty high uh, regularity for, for psi, which, uh, which we, if you need to do that, you have to go to such a high, uh, such high a priori estimates with psi that
that it requires you to also go to very high or higher a priori estimates with the velocity. And that level of regularity for velocity can only be obtained if you have um, if, if you start taking derivatives of the density. But we want to work with rho in L infinity, right? Uh, no, no derivative regularity for the density. So the usual energy-based approach uh, is not going to work here, okay? And so we overcome this by actually using uh, parabolic maximal regularity results for the Schrodinger equation. And in doing so, we actually moved this threshold for the global solutions, right? Uh, we went from global up to four and then almost global beyond that in 2D. Uh, even in 3D, we were able to move the threshold from four all the way to infinity. So any finite value of P uh, actually has uh, global solutions, okay? And the same estimates in 3D can also be uh, utilized in 2D. So this improves the result that, we present, that I presented uh, up till now. So here is, um, the uh, the theorem in in three dimensions. Uh, this is a typo. It should not say weak nonlinearities because it's for on all nonlinearities. It's a typo. So we fix our p to be between one and infinity. Okay, and then we choose some delta between zero and a third that is sufficiently small and also smaller than one over p minus one. Okay, um, and now we. We uh, say that the uh, wave function is again in H2 or the three-dimensional torus. The velocity is in H1. Rho is again between little mi and capital MI. Okay. And once you give me a little mf that is between zero and mi, right, a uh, uh, bound density, then I can guarantee the existence of uh, as long as it takes. is sufficiently small. And this smallness condition only depends on the system parameters. Um, the solution has uh, the, the same regularity as before, velocity and density, uh, except the renormalized solution, and, uh, like I just mentioned, was uh, is continuous in time only up to L6, not beyond that because of the three-dimensional embedding. Um, the wave function is continuous in time H2, L2 time H3, okay, which is the same as before, but we also get L1 plus a little bit in time and H dot seven halves plus a little bit in space. Okay. Uh, this delta one is not the same as delta. It's another small, small uh, positive constant. And once again, the solution also satisfies the energy equality. So this is our result in 3D. So uh, I want to present the uh, the tools that, that were utilized here. Okay, so the first thing is, uh, we're going to deal with uh, parabolic regularity. So that requires an elliptic, uh, a uniformly elliptic operator. Okay, so in our case, it is the, La the Laplacian because remember that the Schrodinger equation is now parabolic. It, it has a heat equation nature to it. So there's a Laplacian there, which uh, allows us to use that as the elliptic operator of, of our choice. So if you have um, an elliptic operator, right, of this general kind, then uh, with the print, its principal uh, being basically the derivatives are replaced by the frequencies, so uh, xi alpha, then it is said to be uniformly k zeta elliptic. If there exists a bound, a constant k, and uh, an angle zeta between zero and pi by two, so that all of the coefficients um, a alpha here, all of these are uniform bounded by k, Right, um, the inverse of the principal symbol is also uniformly bounded in time, space, and frequency. And the spectrum of the uh, of this elliptic operator uh, is bounded to a, a a section or a uh, or a sector in the right half of the complex plane. Okay, of of uh, half width zeta. So it's it's like that. So there's the Real act, uh, the real, the positive real axis, and then you have um, this sector of where this spectrum exists for the uh, elliptic operator is like this. So it is within the positive half plane. So if you have such a uniformly elliptic operator, okay, and you have um, an evolution equation governed with this elliptic operator, a parabolic equation of this kind, um, then the maximal regularity estimate states the following. Uh, 
what we are really interested in is in this term. So this U, the solution, in some LR uh, regularity in time, where R is strictly bigger than one, and the spatial regularity is governed by X1, where X1 is the domain um, of this, uh, this operator, A. So for instance, with our Laplacian, that would be H2. Okay, so here you would have H2, and then you have LR, R bigger than one. So that norm is bounded by the initial velocity or initial U in an interpolation space, Y, right? So that is a, a real interpolation space. And then also by a certain norm of the inhomogeneity or the forcing on the right-hand side. Okay, so this, this is the tool, the main tool that we will be using here. So in our case, like I said, we have um, minus this, this uh, complex constant times Laplace, and that becomes our operator A. It's very easy to check that this is uh, uniformly K zeta elliptic, okay? And once we know that, what we do next is we uh, act upon the, the Schrodinger equation NLS by negative Laplacian to the power of three fourths plus delta one by two, where delta one is some small constant that will be fixed later on, okay? So what this is, is basically we're acting by three halves plus a little bit, that many derivatives on the NLS. And then we use maximum parabolic regularity, okay? where um, the x space is L2 and then x1 is, is H2, which is governed by the, um, the elliptic operator that we have. So this is what the regular, uh, the elliptic uh, or maximal parabolic regularity states is that this is now our U, right? Because the entire equation is acted upon by this. So this becomes our U that in LR H2 norm is bounded by this operator on the initial condition in this interpolation space between x, which is L2, and x1, which is H2, plus all of the other terms uh, in the NLS. These are all the coupling terms that arise from P, from the coupling operator, okay? And remember that R has to be strictly bigger than one, the time integrability. So we call that one plus delta a little bit, where delta is between zero and a third. Um, now, the main thing to be noted here is look at the initial condition. That's the main thing I want to highlight. Um, that is being interpolated between uh, L2 and H2, which gives rise to um, a Besov space, a Besov norm of this kind. And uh, for delta, um, the reason you choose delta less than a third is because if delta is less than a third, then this uh, derivative regularity in the Besov space is less than one half, okay? That means because here you're applying a little over three halves. So three halves plus a tiny amount on psi naught. And you're calculating that in a little less than one half derivatives. So three halves plus a little plus one half minus a little bit. So it's possible to adjust these plus and minuses appropriately so that you actually get H2. You get exactly two derivatives. So that you still work with the same data that we have, which is uh, psi naught in H2. Okay. So this whole initial condition term can be bounded by the H2 norm of the initial wave function. And using this regularity, we can go back to our psi L infinity, which is which can be bounded by psi in H2, B psi in L infinity, which can be bounded by H three halves plus a little bit. And we can actually, we have enough regularity now to ensure that for any time t, this integral is less, is bounded by our data. So by making the data sufficiently small, we get that this integral will be less than mi minus mf, right? And that ensures the density is bounded below by mf. Okay. Um, so yeah, that, so, and this whole estimate, this these estimates here are independent of p. So we are not doing any more of the dyadic trick where only for certain values of p, you get a convergent series for other values we don't. So this is an improvement over the previous result. Uh, and it also works in three dimensions and two dimensions. Um, so yeah, uh, with, with that, uh, I just want to mention a few maybe open problems or things that are interesting that arose from here, um, which is one could look at the full compressible system of Pitevsky model, right? Um, which is something that we're checking right now. We're looking, we're interested in that. We're looking at um, uniqueness, uh, 
especially following the recent or from a few years ago, the work of uh, Dan Shane and Mukha, uh, where they were able to show that for an incompressible inhomogeneous uh, system, Navier-Stokes, uh, even when the density is just L infinity in space and time, that is enough to actually show uniqueness. Um, so very cool result that they proved. Um, but yeah, the problem of large initial data is still open. Right? Everything here was done for small enough data. Um, also, we've avoided the existence of a vacuum. So how one would deal with that or extending to RP or R2, that's still uh, out in the open. We do not know just as including temperature effects are. Um, if, so if you include the entropy equation, things will get even more complicated. And uh, I, I hope someone uh, is brave enough to look at that system in the future. Um, and uh, there are many other, uh, there are some other results for a macro scale model as well um, of superfluidity. So uh, the reason I mentioned that here is just because it's uh, superfluidity is, uh, or it's models, especially where the normal and superfluids are in conjunction with each other or interacting with each other uh, are new to the mathematical community. So we hope that some of these works can uh, inspire more interest into these topics. Okay. Um, yeah, with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and uh, just some of the references I, I mentioned in the paper, uh, talk. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Pranav, for the great talk. Um, yeah. So yeah, are there any questions in the audience? <clears throat> Yeah, so, uh, um, yeah, I, I just would like to know about, uh, so did you think about the, the, the behavior uh, in terms of the, the lambda? So if, if, I, if I understand well the model, when lambda goes to zero, you get a decoupled system, right? You get the Schrodinger decoupled with the, um, right? Uh, that's right. So do you, have, do you have any idea about the behavior when lambda goes to zero or? Um... No. So in, in our analysis here, we have put lambda, we fixed the values of lambda and mu and all of these parameters, because mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's very crucial to us that there exists this dissipation for the for the Schrodinger equation, right? So yeah. which means the lambda acts like a viscosity. So all of our estimates, um, many of our estimates will actually have inverse powers of lambda that pop up, right? When we extract out terms, when we use like the uh, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality and things like that, so um, to absorb terms, so we will the, the results that we have are are not well suited to the to take the limit lambda going to zero. Okay. Yeah, uh, but that would definitely be uh, interesting to see if if there is a way to to get back uh, a purely superfluid and a pure normal fluid by decoupling them in the limit, but uh, I I don't know how one would approach that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and about about uniqueness again, you, you already mentioned that it's uh, it's open. So, uh, yes, uh, the the main thing is that we we don't have enough uh, uh, regularity of the density, right? The row there's no uh, like the time derivative of row is I believe in L two H minus one. Mm -hmm. So you don't but, have enough regularity of yeah, but, but you, uh, I mean, you, you already mentioned the work by Donson and Wong, which is uh, the case where you, they deal with that with, uh, with, uh, in the case right. of so, nanogenous Navier-Stokes. And I, I believe the, the, the Psi here has a lot of regularity, so that you should not really wor worry a lot about it, right? Yes, yes. So uh, exactly. So we, we believe that, that that would work. We're still in the process of, of checking that, uh, but uh, we don't know for sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But we, we hope that, that that approach will will work here. Um, yeah, the, there they I think they worked along the Lagrangian formulation, right? They worked along characteristic paths in that uh, yeah. in their approach, Danshan and Mukha. So ah, I, talking, what, oh, I, I was talking about another work by Donshan and Wong, uh, which is a recent one, maybe it's more recent. Ah, okay, I, I'm not. Yeah, aware they of they that. don't use the, the Lagrang Lagrangian approach at all, so it's it's only energy estimates. Yeah, I see. Okay. It, could, it could maybe fit well in in the context of the, or, or fit well with with the, with, that, with the approach that you are using here in, in, in obtaining the global existence. It's just purely it's just energy estimates, even for for the for the uniqueness part. Yeah, but they rely okay. uh, they rely on time weighted estimates. Maybe this is something that right. they can. They, 
that was the same thing in Danshan and Mukha as well. Uh, but mm-hmm. in the end, they, for uniqueness, they work along uh, the Lagrangian paths, right? So that the continuity equation just becomes uh, like rho t is equal to zero along the, because yeah, it's but... in homogeneous. And then uh, along that path, the, because it's just rho t equal to zero, yeah. we can show that there's a unique solution. Yeah, the problem here is that the density is not just transported, but uh, yeah. On the other the other hand, uh, the way they do it in the uh, in the last paper, it's like uh, so the estimate the estimate they do the, the stability estimate for the density in a negative subtle space, and uh, it's, it's it's purely it's purely um in energy energy estimate. But yeah, it's it's something okay. that we can can for later. So um, let me just ask if there are uh, any more questions in the audience before. Yeah, okay, so if, so if not, uh, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much for, for the opportunity.